Praise the Lord, everyone. Why don't we stand and invite the Lord into our class tonight and thank Him for heat. Anybody like heat? Let's be thankful. Amen. Let's lift our hands and our voices, invite Him into our class tonight. Can we do that together? Jesus, we thank You, Lord. God, for this evening, God, I thank you for this day that you've given to us. Lord, I invite your presence into this place, Lord. I lift my hands and my voices to you, and I thank you, Lord, that we can be in this place, Lord. I thank you that we can be here, that your presence is here. Lead us and guide us. Teach us tonight, Lord. I praise your name, and I worship you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Praise God. Well, I hope you've had a good day, but if not, it's about to get better. Two reasons. The day's almost over, and you're in the house of God, learning about Him. And there can be no better way for the day to get better. Amen. Praise God. Prayer requests that you have before we go to the Lord with our needs. Any spoken requests? Sister Rhonda? All right. Sister Janelle? All right. Brother John? Amen. Brother Keith? All right. It's good to see Brother Keith in the house of God again. Amen. Brother Owen? Excellent. All right. So the medicine's working. And we're thanking the Lord that the report on Kitty is... Positive. She does have leukemia, but it is leukemia that is um, not the aggressive kind is the best way to say it. So it's not that there, but medicines can handle it a lot better. And uh, so we're thanking the Lord for that and praying for the Lord to continue to be with her. Any other spoken needs? Coming across, Sister Lori. All right. Any other spoken needs? All right. Unspoken needs, if you'd lift your hand to the Lord so your neighbor can agree with you in prayer. And let's go before him. Jesus, thank you, Lord, that we can come to you, God, and bring our needs to you. God, I thank you that you're the healer, you're the savior, you're the comforter, Lord. You're the one who provides and gives direction. And God, I bring these needs, Lord, along with my brothers and sisters before you, asking you to touch and minister in every single one of them. God, we trust you and we believe in you, Lord. And God, we know that you can do the impossible. So God, now these needs that we bring before you, whether it be direction, maybe it's salvation for a family member, healing, Lord Jesus. God, we ask that you would do it, that you would hear our prayers and that you would respond. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. You may be seated. And uh, Brother Keith, you got to let Nick Horn out there. I'm not going to make you work yet. I'll let you uh, let you sit and relax a little bit. And uh, Brother Owen, you, you you think you're up to take the offer tonight? And he's already up and at it. Amen. Let's pray God's blessing on our giving. Jesus, we thank you that we can give. Bless, Lord, in our giving now. Let it be used for your kingdom and according to your will. And I pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. A couple of announcements. One is uh, those of you that are ladies. Uh, don't forget that there is a ladies' meeting this Friday night. And uh, also on Saturday, there's Bible quiz tournament. Uh, and then at 2 o'clock at the same location in Pennsville, uh, it will be a Sunday school rally. So if you'd like to come see some Bible quizzing and or come to the Sunday school rally, that's available to you just across the bridge uh, off of, is it Broad Street? Yeah, Broad Street. Take the right there in Pennsville and just Route 49, just follow it down on the right-hand side. Queen of the Apostles Church is where uh, the uh, church is, and you can come and be with us. And also, men's retreat's coming up, but everybody knows about that, and then we're into February. So I want to draw your attention to those items on the schedule. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, we're going to return to the ongoing series of Essentials of Christianity. And um, 
I'm not going to run through every one of the previous lessons, but I do want to draw your attention to a particular set which we are picking back up with, if you will, in some concepts tonight. Essential number seven, salvation by grace. Uh, excuse me, essential number six, the only Savior saves us by His grace. Essential number seven, salvation by grace comes through faith or believing. And essential number eight, grace works when faith or believing results in action. And so what I want to do is, as we talked about last lesson in this series, you must be born from above. God has chosen to save us. He could have destroyed us. He could have marked us off. He could have said, I'm done. I'm going to restart. He chose not to. In his love, in his mercy, and in his grace, he chose not to. And so he crafted a plan in which he, the only Savior, saves us. How does he do that? Well, he does that by having us be born from above. Not a human, physical rebirth, but rather a spiritual rebirth. Because the problems of sin, though many times expressed in the physical world, are a spiritual problem. The problem of disobedience, which is the genesis of sin entering the world and by, um, by that means then death, is a spiritual problem. Adam and Eve chose not to believe God. He said, you may not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you eat thereof, you will die. Sin entered the world because Eve and Adam didn't believe God. God chose not, as I've already stated, chose not to cut them off. He removed them from the garden, yes. Death did enter the world, and it is appointed unto us once to die. Because of sin, death entered the world, and you, if you live long enough, will die. Some of you are sleeping. You didn't get the joke. Brother Owen did. He kind of tucked his head and laughed a little bit. If you live long enough, you will die. And what that means is, what I mean by that is, is, is that many times we distinguish between accidents, things that happen, things that are unintended. Even those are death that, that God did not design. But you cannot be safe long enough. You will eventually simply die. Sin is eating away at us. That's why as you get older, things break down. Because we are in a broken world. And so death did happen. So when God chose not to give up on us, when he chose to say, I am the Savior, when he chose to say, I'm going to create a way for people to be saved through me, it is going to be my mercy, my grace, that I extend to people in salvation. He went back to exactly the same place we broke creation in the first place. Because we broke it because we didn't believe what he said. He said, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We didn't believe him. So when it comes to being born from above, that is actually a broad description of a number of things that need to happen within your life. That have physical expressions, but are all expressions of a spiritual reality. That which is born of the flesh, Jesus said, is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. He did not say to Nicodemus, you must be born again Meaning going back into your mother's womb and then being born again. That is human. He said, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. You must be born from above. You must allow me to engage you into a process whereby, if we would invoke the Old Testament prophet, your old heart is removed and a new heart is put in. In which your old spirit is removed and a new spirit is put in. Now, how does this happen? How does this being born from above occur? And that's what we want to look at tonight is how does it start? And here's where we have to pick back up, if you will, on a concept that we gave you in, in principle 
and now is beginning to come back into focus in application because the birth from above begins with active faith. No one can or will be born from above without faith and without a live faith. In fact, it is impossible to have inert faith. Inert meaning that it is not alive or it is not active. There is not a state of rest of faith. It either is or it isn't. Okay? Now, the passages of Scripture I'm going to give you tonight are not new to you. That's why I alluded to the past lessons, because they were introduced in a different context and in a very related context. But here I want to focus your attention to understand that when it comes to being born from above, when it comes to having a spiritual transformation that is the grace of God in operation... It must begin with active faith. You cannot be born from above without your participation. You cannot be born from above without the grace of God. There is nothing you can do on your own to be born from above. All the self-help books... They will only address human things. They will not fix the spiritual. All of the self-improvement that you can do, all of the self-discipline that you can encourage, all of the improved actions that you can do on your own, none of these will affect, will accomplish a birth from above. That which is human is human, Jesus said. That which is spiritual is spiritual. I am not talking to you, Nicodemus, about human. I'm talking to you about a spiritual rebirth. But that spiritual rebirth, while we can do nothing alone to accomplish it, we still are active participants in it. God must be involved in the process. It is ultimately His grace and His mercy That even allows us the opportunity to be born from above. He is from above. That birth from above, that spiritual birth is enabled by Him for He is spirit. But you and I have a part. We have a piece. We have a starting place. No one comes to God unless God draws them. So not a single human being can be saved without God drawing them. The good news is, is the scriptures tell us without any equivocation that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that word whosoever is extremely crucial because it means that God is drawing all men unto him. So God has done his part at Calvary. God has done his part in his spirit to reach out and draw folks. And so as the Spirit of God begins to draw a person, as they begin to be realizing that something's up, usually people don't understand what's happening when God begins to draw them. As that occurs, they have a choice. And it starts with whether they're going to believe what it is that God is introducing to them. God will use many different vehicles to introduce it to them. He'll use humans to speak it to them. He'll use circumstances. He'll use all kinds of different mechanisms. Some people will see it in the Word of God. Others will see it in weird places. Some of you can think back to when you came to God and think of things that God used and they were unexpected things to get your attention. Some of you were in a drug haze, but God still got your attention. Some of you were in a drunk haze. God still got your attention. Some of you were completely preoccupied with the ambitions of life. God still found a way To catch your attention. When he gets the person's attention. When he begins to draw them. There comes a point. A critical point. And there's probably a series of these critical points. Where the person has to make a choice. 
Do I blow off what God is doing? They don't necessarily know it's God. They don't necessarily know what it is. But do I blow it off? Do I ignore it? Do I treat it as if it's not true? Or do I believe it? Now the frustrating thing for us as Christians is, is there is absolutely nothing beyond prayer. And I understand that's a funny statement because prayer is powerful. But there is nothing beyond prayer that you can do to control this initial stage. The only person you have the ability to control faith in is yourself. You cannot control faith in anyone else. Because in fact, it's the enactment of the very thing that God intended for good, we used for evil, and that is choice. We get to choose whether to believe him or not believe him. Now, if birth from above begins with active faith, what's faith? Now, you all should remember this one. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. The thing we have to remember is that every single human being was created in the image of God. That image has not left a single one of us. It has been buried by sin. It has been rubbed on by wickedness. It has been tempered by bad living. All kinds of things have twisted it and turned it. But there is still the image of God in every single human being. Whether we are cognizant of it, whether we are aware of it, whether we know what language to talk about it in, every human being, by the very definition of our existence, is aware of God. Because no human being comes into existence without the breath of life being breathed into them by the very God that I speak of. And by that means they become a living soul. We were not produced in a factory. We are not Model T Fords. We are not a Dell computer. We're not even apples. We are human beings. Made in God's likeness. After his image. And that creation from its very beginning we are aware we realize there's something about us that's different how we articulate it very different how much we are willing to talk about it different from person to person but we are aware that we are different than the rest of the world around us so when God begins to reach out when he begins in his spirit to draw and that is the beginning of a birth from above a baby has nothing to do with its birth you realize that? A baby has not, you know, we talk about it when it's ready to come out. That baby isn't what sets when it's going to come out. That mother's body is what sets when that baby's going to come out. It's a set of hormones, interactions of chemicals. That baby does not choose, say, I think I'll wait two more days. I know mothers have long liked to talk like it's the baby's fault. This baby won't come out. It really isn't the baby. That baby is not capable of coming out. The whole birthing process is a birthing process that if that baby had to on its own come out, it would never come out. It would stay inside of its home until it ruptured its home and died in the process of rupturing its home. Aren't all the mothers glad that it doesn't do that? Well, your body won't typically let it do that because it will eventually begin, because of chemical changes, it will begin to start the labor pains. I promise you, babies are not excited to be born. How would you like to be squeezed through a very, very tight channel? And popped out the other side from a dark 
wet room to a bright, dry room. And then proceed to have your first moment in life initiated by some form of pain. Not extreme, but nonetheless. Something to get you to cough. Something to get you to cry so that you clear your passageway and suddenly you're having a new sensation because you didn't breathe. And now you're breathing air. My point in all of this is simply for you to recognize that a baby does not have anything to do with its coming into existence. It does not control its growth. And it does not control its birth. Now that's where the analogy has to break down. What I'm saying to you is, is the initial process for a person to be born from above does not start with the person. It starts with God. That is why it is so crucial to understand God's love for us. That is why I am going to, uh, if, I, if it's the last thing I do, I am going to speak for the rest of my ministry, and I've been doing it for a number of years, telling people, stop blaming God for the mess in this world. It is not God's fault. In fact, if anything, God's the cleaner. He's coming in and cleaning up our mess. We keep making messes. And he keeps coming in and trying to clean it up. This is not God's fault. We didn't believe him. He told us what was going to happen. We didn't believe him. Why did he put it there in the first place? That's not the point. If he was going to make us in his image so that we were not simply a dolphin or an elephant or a lion or a flower or a bug. Because he made us in his image, he gave us choice. And choice requires the existence of at least two alternatives. He told us the one that was good. He told us the one that was bad. He says, choose the good one. Do not choose the bad one. We didn't believe him. Stop blaming God. Stop blaming God. Oh, why didn't he do? Why didn't he do more? You're not reading the gospel that I'm reading. God's done an amazing amount. God's holy, yet he came and took sin. God is high and lifted up, yet he descended and humbled himself. He was pushed out of one of those very tight tunnels. The God of glory who sits on a throne with angels, thousands and thousands, maybe millions, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how many there really are. Shouting, crying with a loud voice, holy, 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 nonstop, all day long. That God came and lived inside of one of his creation. Don't tell me God doesn't love you. He does. Don't tell me that God didn't care for you. He does. You say, well, look at the crap that I've gone through. Look at the horrible things that happened in my life. Yes. And we get to thank ourselves. And we get to thank our forebears who collectively between ourselves and our forebears have created the messy world we're living in. Well, what about all the acts of God? That's a misnomer. They're not acts of God. They're acts of God's creation that was broken by us. Who made all of the brokenness of our world? We did. Creation groans. Remember this lesson? Creation groans under the same burden that we are under. We imposed it on creation. When God made the animals first, they didn't hunt us. We didn't have to run from them. We didn't hunt them. We were at peace with them. We broke this. God's only thing that he has done is he first refused to cut us off. Second, he then created an avenue whereby we could be born from above. And third, he then begins to draw us to be reconciled to him. He begins the process. So as human beings, as Christians, we need to understand that God is the initiator. We are not. 
But once he initiates, and we begin to hear that voice, and he will address us uniquely, he will minister to us personally, we immediately face a choice. Do we believe? Now the definition there is important. Because what God offers to us in the gospel, what he offers to us in a birth from above, is an offering that has human results, but in its substance, it's spiritual. It is not a human birth, it is a birth from above. So you can't see it. This is why it requires faith. You cannot see it. This is where Christians have gone wrong. Be very careful not to do this. Do not drag down the salvation of God to simply a human function. I am not telling people that they don't need to repent of their sins. I am not telling people they do not need to be baptized in Jesus' name. I am not telling people they do not need to receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I am not telling people they don't need to live a holy life. But please understand that a birth from above is more than the human, sensible elements that occur. It's not just speaking in tongues. It's not just being baptized in Jesus' name. It's not just a moment of repentance. It is not just the covenantal relationship in which we change how we live. No, there is something much more substantial that occurs. It is a spiritual rebirth. God starts it, but then we have to choose whether we believe it. Because the birth from above, while it does have moments within it, the birth from above is actually an ongoing process. How many of you believe with me you have not yet arrived? Apostle Paul said, I have not yet arrived, but I put the past behind me and I press forward towards the mark. The ultimate culmination of the salvation plan of God is for us to be returned to what we were intended to be. So between God's drawing and that moment when we are returned to it, we are engaged in a process that can be described collectively as the birth from above. A birth from above, let me take you back one, begins with active faith. Christians who think that the birth from above is a moment are grossly mis, uh, mistaken in understanding God's process. When you repent of your sins and you're baptized in Jesus' name and you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, if you stop there, you won't make heaven your home. Can some of you remember back to the very moment after which you had repented of your sins, you'd been baptized in Jesus' name and you'd received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the, of the, uh, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues? Can you remember how you looked? Can you remember how you thought? Can you remember your language? Can you remember your lifestyle? Now, just from the vantage point of where you're at today, right now, which we all agreed we have not yet arrived, just from the vantage point of where you are today, can I ask you a question? Were you doing everything you're supposed to do? Were you dressing the way you should dress? Were you thinking the way you should think? Was your language right? Was your thought process right? Or has there been movement from then till now? Everybody agree there's been movement? It's process. Thank God there's been movement. Don't stop that movement. But the birth from above begins with active faith. It cannot begin without the grace of God. But it also cannot continue. God, what he begins and initiates, cannot continue unless you respond back. God has again created a scenario where he tells us something and we choose. 
Now, he has to start that process because sin has grabbed a hold of us. Sin has us under his grip. So he performs miraculous moves to start his grace in motion. But that birth from above cannot take place. It cannot begin if you do not have active faith. So faith is that element. It is believing. It is an assurance about things we cannot see. It is God literally placing into the heart and the mind of human beings hope for something that they don't yet have. I've listened to all kinds of people who have come to God, and they always, didn't matter if they were druggies or they were really successful executives, doesn't matter if they were immoral or they were quote, upstanding citizens. They, they always talk about certain things, no matter what their actions were, no matter what their attitudes were, they always talk about that there was something inside of them that just seemed to tell them there's more than what I'm doing. There's something else. Now, for a long time, we've characterized that as being an attribute of the human being. Can I suggest to you that that is not simply an attribute of the human being? That is God drawing on you. That is the God initiating within you. He does it with every single human being. But when that begins to be initiated, the hope for that which you cannot see, you have to choose whether to squelch that or start believing in it. Now, faith is not just believing in something out there, but rather, verse 6, which we've looked at before, tells us what it is. First of all, it says it's impossible to please God without faith. And then it says that anyone who wants to come to Him has two things that have to happen. So when God starts with His grace to reach out to a person, they have two things that they have to make a choice about. Number one, they have to believe that He is. I didn't say that you would use the language of God. I didn't say you would know your Bible well. But there has to be in that little kernel of faith, there has to be a response to the initiation of God that you actually believe it. You've got to believe that He is. And the second is, is that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. Because if you don't believe that, you won't seek Him. And therefore, you will not take the seed of faith that is given to every human being by virtue of our creation, and you will not act on it. So the birth from above, even though much of this may have happened quickly within your life, even though much of this may have happened under the radar, if you will, where you're not fully aware of it or cognizant of it, what is happening in every single human being is they are broken by sin, they have the inability, they are unable to fix the problem of their life. They're unable to fix the broken world in which they're living. But there's a God who begins to reach out to them. There's a God who begins to draw from them. Have you ever noticed how absolutely diverse the church of God is? It is not geographically defined. It is not ethnically defined. It is not language-based defined. It's not skin color defined. It's not educationally defined. It is not monetarily defined. What's it defined by? Active faith. Doesn't matter where a person's coming from, God can reach out and touch them. But the birth from above cannot begin unless when He touches them, they respond. It is literally a heart issue. What determines whether your young person serves God or not? You can control whether when they choose not to believe in God, whether life gets rough or not. And I am on the record as a firm believer that if my children do not choose to serve God, as long as they are under my responsibility... They are going to live in a living hell. Because I'm not going to help them not believe in God. 
Can I make them believe in God? Absolutely not. Never implying that you as parents control the choices of your children. You do not. You just have a window where you control their clothes, their food, their car, their gasoline, the roof over their head, the access to computers. All the stuff of life. That's all you control. The interesting thing about human beings is when you start messing with the roof over their head, the clothes on their back, the food they're eating, the computers they have access to, the car they can or cannot drive, the gasoline they get or don't get, it sometimes causes human beings to pause for a moment and think about certain decisions a second time. That's the only thing you're doing. I want to be clear about that. You are not able to force your children to serve God. You can just cause them to think twice about not serving Him. You can create circumstances that because of your love and your commitment are much more gentle than the circumstances that will be coming if they stop seeking God. And those of you that have served God and then also been out in the world, can I get an amen at how bad it can be out there? So all you're doing is, please understand, I'm not trying to abuse my children, but when I use that language, I promise you the living hell in my home is by no means comparable to the living hell the devil will give them out there. I don't want to kill my children. The devil does. I don't want to emaciate my children. The devil does. I don't want to string them out on drugs. The devil does. I don't want to give them diseases that will destroy their life. Devil does. I don't want to take their hopes and crush them. Devil does. And that's what he's doing. You got to take seriously. See, you got to be a believer as well. You got to believe that unless your kids are born from above, they are going to have the crappiest life possible. Sin is going to ravage them. It's going to destroy them. You have to be a believer in that. If you don't really believe that, then you'll make peace with your kids not choosing God. Now, the reason I started in on this was not to go into all that whole diatribe, even though I gave you that little bit. The point is, you do not control their response to God. You don't control the person you witness to on the job. God reaches out to them, and then they have to choose whether they believe. Now, here's part of the faith as a Christian. Remember, two points to the essentials of Christianity. One is for our own understanding. The other is is the ability to communicate to others. Let me deal with the first point. It is important for you to understand that you do not control anybody's response to God. I dealt some with this in in an evangelism meeting, and I'm touching on it in some senses in this. You do not have the ability to make somebody choose God. You don't have the ability to make your spouse choose God. I remember very graphically asking my father. It was right out in the parking lot. I remember very clearly. He's probably about 16 years old. And I said, God, or I said, Dad. He was kind of God then. Controlled my car, my gas, my housing. You got it. And uh, so I, I I said to my dad, I said, how do I know for sure That the woman I choose to marry will never leave God. In other words, how do I get control of her faith? And I'll never forget. Now, my dad's a pretty intense fellow. All that thing about living hell and all that stuff, that's how I was raised. If you want to be nasty, you've got to be nasty at two of us. You've got to be nasty at me, and you've got to be nasty at him. Because that's how I was raised. He looked at me and he said, son, you can't, you can't control that. When you choose to marry somebody, you are taking a risk. They could at any point say, I don't want to serve God. And when they do, they'll mess your life up. And there's not a thing you can do about it. Now, you can stack the deck in your, in your, uh, in your favor. There's some very clear signals that you'll know there's going to be problems in the future. If she doesn't or he doesn't come to church faithfully now, he or she is probably not going to come to church faithfully then. If he or she doesn't give to God of their finances, 
They're probably not going to just because you're married to them. I've been married long enough to know that marriage, in fact, if anything, the best that you have it, as far as your personalities and as far as getting along, is before you're married, not after. It gets worse afterwards because you already got each other. So you stop behaving. Come on now. Some of you are sitting out there acting like I don't know what I'm talking about. You've been married long enough to know exactly what I'm talking about. You stop behaving. You, stop being the re- you start being the real you. I'm not saying you were being fake. But I am saying that you stop worrying about it. You got the woman. You got the man. So the best you got is when you're dating or you're courting. That's the best you got it. So if they don't, if they don't pass muster spiritually at that point, they're not going to pass muster once you marry them. It's going to go downhill, not, not uphill. You do not control it. They do. Here's the good news, though. If that is true, that you do not control the response of a person to God reaching out to them spiritually to begin the process of being born from above, here's the good news. Nobody controls your response. Now, that's the good news. Doesn't matter what your mom and dad did to you. Doesn't matter what your circumstances. Doesn't matter how bad your choices are. You still, being created in the image of God, have the ability to choose to respond to the grace of God and say, I believe. And that is probably one of the most powerful things that God stacked into his creation. I'm not saying he wanted us to sin, but I think he knew there was a potential that we were going to sin. And he stacked the deck. He built into it the ability for us, even in sin, to exercise a powerful force, the ability to overrule ourselves. How many of you have ever overruled yourself? Wanted three pieces of pie and you only ate two. That's an overrule. Have you ever seen a monkey overrule itself? Monkey wants three pieces of pie. Monkey eats three pieces of pie. I'm using a simple example, but it's true. Animals do what their instincts tell them. We overrule ourselves. Now, sometimes we don't do it as much as we should. And I'm not just talking about pieces of pie. But we have the ability to say to ourselves, no. It's choice. When God touches a person through his grace and with his grace, that person has to choose. And the choice is, is whether to believe. Now, the Lord's brother told us this, and I, again, we went through this whole passage. So, again, I'm only pulling out two verses of Scripture for the sake of the lesson tonight. He said, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Now, it depends on how you phrase it. The way James is phrasing it is, is the idea that there is faith where I simply say that I believe, but I don't do anything. That, just saying I believe, is faith by itself. I would contend to you that James, in fact, is telling us that faith that is simply a statement, that is not active, that has no action with it, is not faith at all. He calls it dead faith. But anything that's dead isn't really what it's claiming to be. If I'm dead, I'm not Stephen J. Beardsley. Can't speak, can't walk, can't talk. I can't do anything. Everything has ceased. So I don't want you to mistake and think that by James saying that faith is dead, well, okay, that just means there's, there's faith sitting there, but it's just potential. It's not going to go anywhere. No, no, no. You face choices. You either believe or you don't believe. And believing is not what we have gotten so comfortable within Christianity of doing and making it a statement. Even our language, a faith statement. Faith cannot be a statement. Faith is action. 
Faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, unless it produces action, it's dead and it's useless. Then in verse 24, so you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by what we say, not by faith alone. Well, wait a minute, I thought we were made right with God by grace. We are. Well, then what's James talking about? James says we're made right with God by what we do. We are. Well, which is it? Both. This is the problem that theologians for a long time have had. They have made it an either-or proposition. It's either the grace of God or my active faith. Change the language. It's not an either-or. It's a both-and. It is both the grace of God and my response to the grace of God, namely my active faith. You take the grace of God out of the equation, and the and has nothing to go with it. It's the car with no engine. But how many of you have ever seen an engine get anywhere? It needs a car. The example I've given you in the past. This building is wired for electricity. All of the potential is there. You can wire this building, and if you don't hook up the electricity, nothing works. That's my example of going to Home Depot and picking out a switch and flicking it. Because it's not, it's got the potential, but it's not wired. It does not have what it needs. The electricity is what it needs. You don't turn on lights, not really. You turn switches. You pull the electricity, you don't get any light by flicking a switch. But you can have all the electricity wired into this building. All of the bulbs are where they're supposed to be. And if you won't flick the switch, you won't get any light. So it is dependent upon your active faith. It is dependent on you actually believing that when you flick that switch, lights are going to come on. It's interesting to me that humanity is able to believe in electricity. But is not able to believe. Has anybody ever seen electricity? We've seen the effects of electricity. Oh, there's plenty of ways to see the effects of electricity. I can show you the effects of God, too. You can see the effects of electricity, but you don't actually see electricity. Electricity is defined as protons and neutrons and electrons. Oh, is it just electrons? Yeah, you're right. You can't see them. Can you see them? So why do we believe in it, but we don't believe in the God who made it? Because His creation... Is made in his image and after his likeness. We in particular. But he made all of his creation so Paul said that it screams out about him. The stars, the sun, the moon, the trees, the earth, the clouds. Everything is telling us about him. And it is amazing to me that we can become so much a believer in things we cannot see. Such as electricity. But we can't believe in the God who made it. It's a choice. There's a multitude of reasons why we might not choose to believe, but it is a choice. You cannot be saved without active faith. I thought we were saved by grace. You are. Well, then what's my active faith have to do with it? Because God has chosen to give you choice. He will not save you if you tell him no. In fact, I'll go one step further. He cannot save you if you tell him no. You have the ability to tell the creator of heaven and earth in whose hands all power resides. No. Some of you have heard this story before. Because one of the things that Christians have tried to do for a long, long time 
taking very seriously Hebrews 11.6. You can't please God without faith. You must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of them diligently seek him. So Christians have tried to come up with human means to prove the existence of God. Because the premise is pretty simple. If we can prove to a human being that God exists, then we will have, by proving it, have been able to force them to at least take step one. Believe that God is. Then, of course, there's step two, that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him or, and seek him out. So they've tried to do step one. Despite very valiant efforts, human beings have never been able, by human standards, shouldn't surprise us, but to prove the existence of God. The proofs about the existence of God only work for those who already believe in him. There's always a piece missing that has to be supplied by faith. Now, I can't remember all the proofs. Nick probably can. They're probably more wedded into his head than in mine. They typically fall in the area of philosophy, and a lot of theologians... In the Middle Ages, spent a lot of time looking at these. They're not the only ones, but they're some of the primary ones. I remember writing a paper where my job was, was to basically show that I knew all these proofs. I did know them. I don't now, but I did then. So I wrote this crafty little paper. I thought it was crafty, in which God was in heaven. All these theologians were in heaven, these philosophers. And they all got invited by God over to the big house. I don't know what his big house was, but anyway, over to the big house. God says, I'm bored. I want to be amused. I want you all to come over here and prove my existence, which I thought was kind of funny because God's sitting there, obviously, but he's having them discuss proving that he exists. It, it humored me. I don't know if it humored the prof or not, but it humored me. So then in the construct of this little uh, discussion, I would write, each of the philosophers would put forth their proof of the existence of God, and then I, being the voice of God, that was also kind of fun, I, in the voice of God, would poke holes in it. I'd say, well, you didn't prove this, and what about this, and what about the problem with this? So I get done with the project, I fulfill the requirement, and I get done with the project, and I'm deeply disturbed. I remember very clearly, sitting back from the computer, I worked very hard on it. It was a pretty long paper at the time. It wasn't anything like what I've just written, but it was a long paper at the time. And I sat back from the computer, and I literally, I said to God, I say, God, I've taken the best proofs of your existence, and not a one of them has really totally been able to stand up to my scrutiny. And I'm not the smartest man in the world. How do I prove you exist? Never forget. You can't. Because who I am, the only one who can prove that I exist is me. I have to self-reveal myself. I have to self-reveal. I have to disclose because I'm the only one. All of you are my creation. You cannot grasp me. I have to reveal myself. Never forget my second question. He said, okay, God, then are you withholding yourself from some people? Why is it that some people don't believe in you? If you have to reveal yourself to people, I'm assuming you're revealing yourself, aren't you? Never forget his answer back to me. Hebrews 11, 1 and 11, 6. Yes, I reveal myself to every single human being. I start the process of being born from above. But they have to believe. And when they choose not to believe, I continue to give them breath. I continue to let them live. They exist totally inside of me. And I let them go around proclaiming that the being who makes them alive doesn't exist. And I'm silent. 
comes a point where they, in their faith, can choose to tell me no. And I just go silent. That's a scary place to be. That disturbed me. It bothered me deeply. Please understand. A birth from above starts with God. But God will not force you to be born from above. You have to respond. And the response is active faith. Well, what makes it active? What you do. Because faith alone or faith by itself, faith without action is worthless. Because you don't really believe. Now there can be a great learning curve. Of what it is I'm supposed to do. But at the end of the day. When God finally gets through your thick noggin. Everybody tap your head. You got a thick noggin. We all do. At the end of the day. When he finally gets through. And you tell him no then by definition, you don't believe him. Is my logic too simple? At the end of the day, when God finally gets through, and you still tell him no, then you really don't believe him. The person who keeps fornicating doesn't really believe God that a life fulfilled is impurity. A liar doesn't really believe God that truth is the way to go. Take whatever it is that the Word of God says to you at the end of the day when you don't comply with it. I'm not talking about process. But when you finally, he gets through your thick noggin. When he finally gets through my hard head. At the end of the day, If I continue to insist and tell him no, then I don't really believe him. And the tough part about it is, is you can't believe part of God and not believe other parts of it. He's a complete package. You either believe him that he exists. You either believe him that he rewards you when you do what he tells you to do, or you don't. Now, the fact that that occurs over a process, do not mistake it. At the end of the day, it comes down to one very simple choice. I believe him or I don't. It'll look different. Eve, there was some deception that was involved. But at the end of the day, she didn't believe God. Adam, he had full knowledge. At the end of the day, though, he didn't believe God. So the birth from above, which by the way, remember what Jesus said, you cannot enter, cannot see, cannot enter my kingdom without being born from above. There has to be a spiritual rebirth. That birth from above begins with active faith. If at any point, oh, somebody's taking my control away anyway. Marjorie, click me back over active. If at any point you shut down your obedience, you shut down your faith. And when you shut down your faith, it does you no good. And when you have no faith, you can't interface with the spiritual world because you can't see it. You can't interface with heaven because it's yet to come. It's what you're hoping for. You can't interface with God because without faith, you can't please him. Now, the good news is if you keep your faith active, even if you mess up, you just keep coming back. You keep moving towards God. You keep drawing nigh to God. You keep reaching out 
for God. You keep repenting. You keep doing all of the things. You keep headed in God's direction. Guess what? Your faith's active. You're still believing God. Biggest problem I have, and I know i got to let you go. Biggest problem I have is whenever I'm pastoring somebody and they begin to stop calling sin, sin. Because I know that's the death knell. Because they're not really believing God. Somebody's immoral, I, hey, I understand immorality. I, I, I get that. Somebody's lying, I get that. But when they start telling me, well, I really didn't lie. Well, that's really okay. It's a death knell. Because they're shutting down their faith. It's no longer active. And if you shut down your faith, no matter how much God loves you, and he loves you an awful lot, the grace cannot overcome your dead faith. Electricity can be zinging all over this building, but if you won't flip that switch, lights won't come on. The connection is broken. That's what we did in the garden. We didn't believe God. And we took an on switch and we turned it off. We had a connection with God. It was unfettered. And we broke it. My dad's taught me a little bit. He didn't teach me enough to remember that protons and neutrons weren't involved in electricity. But he has taught me that a switch simply breaks the conduit. So in the garden, we broke it. So God got in there, and through Calvary, he created a new circuit. He said, now, I'm giving you another choice. Before, you had right with me, and your choice was is to leave it that way or to break it. You broke it. Now you're not right with me, but I've created a new conduit. Now your choice is connect with me or leave it broken. How do you connect? Got to believe it. I got to believe that coming to church connects me to God. I got to believe that the word that he's revealed in the scriptures connects me to God. I got to believe that God's financial plan connects me to God. I got to believe that holy living connects me to God. I got to believe that sub, the act of submission in receiving the Holy Ghost connects me to God. I got to believe that baptism in the water in the name of Jesus connects me to God. I got to believe that not just repentance the first time, but daily repentance where I die out to myself connects me to God. I got to believe that fasting, telling my flesh that it's not in control, connects me to God. Everything within the word of God, I have a choice whether I believe it or not. Because of sin, I won't always obey it. I will fail. I will fall short. And then it comes back to the question again. Now what do you believe? And if you call it sin, even as you've done it, you still believe God. Because if you keep calling it sin and you keep taking the action that God tells you to take with regard to that sin, you will eventually beat it. Well, what, am I, what, what, what if I haven't reached perfection? Oh, let's not take the what if. You won't reach perfection. Well, what's the gap then? That's where the grace of God comes in. That's where the grace of God comes in. Christian, don't, don't, don't spend time walking around going, well, what if I sin two seconds before the rapture comes? Stop asking questions like that. You're ignoring the both and. You're ignoring the grace along with the active faith. But if you go and you say, well, since God's going to take care of it, I can just do anything I want. Oh, now you forgot the other part. Your active faith. Is everybody getting it? It's two pieces. One part's God's, one part's yours. Birth from above begins with active faith. Let's stand. Can you lift your voices? And don't tell my wife, but she already knows I ran over. Jesus, thank you, Lord. God, I worship you and I praise you. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. God bless it, Lord. Help it take root within our lives, Lord Jesus. 
I praise you and I worship you, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord. God, I want to be born from above. I want to be transformed. I want my spirit made right with you, O oh God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Marjorie, kill the video.